Hey guys, today I'll show you an apocalyptic horror TV series named The Rain, Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins with a schoolgirl, Simone, who was at school preparing for a crucial exam when her scientist father arrived in a panic. He insisted on taking her somewhere. Puzzled, Simone asked if he wanted her to miss her exam. Her father dodged the question, saying that they couldn't stay here. It's about to rain! This left Simone even more confused, asking what was wrong with it raining and where they were going. Her father stayed on the phone the whole car ride as if there was some urgent matter that left him no time to explain. Suddenly, a news bulletin came over the radio saying that many deaths had been reported in an area after a heavy rainstorm. Simone instantly understood her scientist father was leading them to safety, so she urged her brother Raz to fasten his seatbelt. Distracted by checking on them, her father didn't notice the truck ahead causing a traffic jam. Although Simone's family was unharmed, the gathering storm clouds signaled the imminent rainstorm, sending everyone scrambling back into their cars. Only Simone's father knew that to stay put was a death sentence. He urged his family to run, mentioning a safe place not far off. Still bewildered, Simone ran the whole way. As drops of rain began to fall from the sky, they finally reached an unassuming little bunker. Her father used his fingerprint to open the iron door and everyone filed in. Inside, it was a different world with its own water source and air processing system. Her father instructed everyone to stay inside and never venture out. Just as Simone was about to voice her doubts, she saw her father already in protective gear ready to go out. His expression was serious as he pulled Simone aside and solemnly informed her that the rain carried a lethal virus that could potentially bring about an apocalypse. Only he could find a solution, so he had to leave. Simone was stunned silent by the revelation. Before she could ask any questions, her father continued, urging her to take care of her brother, who was the key to solving everything. Having said that, he walked out of the bunker alone. Simone simply couldn't accept what her father had told her. She quickly pulled out her phone to check the news. The internet was filled with videos of residents being quarantined at home. She put on a calm demeanor and reassured her younger brother that everything would pass. Their mother, seemingly aware of something, assured them that their location was absolutely safe. But no sooner had she spoken than a frantic knock came from outside. Simone and Raz, thinking their father had returned, hurried to open the door, only to find a man wailing in pain standing in the rain. He was about to rush into the bunker when their mother, who had arrived in time, tackled him out. Astonishingly, the virus in the rain was so potent that within a moment, their mother had lost her mobility and collapsed in the pouring rain. Watching this terrifying scene, Simone closed the heavy door of the bunker. She comforted her trembling brother, then tried to call their father, but the call wouldn't go through. Their once happy family was now down to just Simone and Raz. Overwhelmed by guilt and worry for the future, the young girl burst into tears, but she remembered her father's admonition to try and keep things light in front of her brother. While learning to operate the bunker's control system, they discovered there were many other similar shelters. Simone wondered if there might be a connection between them. Perhaps their father could be in one of them. She tried to contact the other bunkers through the internal network, but all attempts failed. Simone didn't lose heart. She was convinced there must be tools to contact the outside world here. The siblings split up to search and eventually found a radio in the storage room. Ecstatic, Simone quickly turned the radio on and, after some searching, was fortunate to connect with a man who had avoided the toxic rain by staying in his basement. Simone gave him her father's phone number, hoping he could help reach her father from outside. Seeing him agree to try, Simone finally felt a sense of relief. However, that evening, the man on the radio relayed that he hadn't been able to contact Simone's father. He informed her that a nearby hospital was taking in survivors, and there might be news of her father there, but he didn't dare to venture out. He explained, the world outside was in chaos, with people acting as if they had gone mad. Before he could say anything else, the radio suddenly cut off. After careful consideration, Simone decided to share the news about the hospital refuge with her brother. She planned to go there to inquire about their father. However, Raz was concerned for her safety and wouldn't allow her to venture out alone. Simone reluctantly agreed, her mind drifting back to an incident a few months ago. For some unknown reason, Raz had contracted a rare virus. Their father, after several tests, had managed to develop a unique antibody treatment. After injecting this into Raz, he was miraculously cured. Although their father's actions weren't universally approved, his company took great interest in this development. Now, Simone suspected that her father's assertion about her brother's importance might be related to this illness. 
While Raz was asleep, she decided to take a risk and venture out, hoping to find their father and confirm her suspicions. As Simone approached the bunker door, she was reminded of their mother's tragic demise. Fear of the outside world paralyzed her, and she found herself unable to muster the courage to step out of the door. After this incident, Simone abandoned all thoughts of leaving. The supplies in the bunker were enough to last them a long time. She devoted herself to caring for her brother in the bunker, hoping that one day their father would return. Days turned into months, and the plants they had grown were maturing. Six years passed in a blink of an eye. Raz had grown taller than Simone, but their father never returned. Food supplies were dwindling, and a sense of anxiety began to spread. Simone knew that waiting was not a solution. It was time to leave the bunker with Raz. But before that, she needed to go out alone to scout the situation, ensuring Raz's safety when they left. Passing the bunker door again, Simone was no longer afraid or hesitant. Her mother had long since turned into a pile of bones. While mourning in silence, Simone was startled by a deer that appeared suddenly. Gathering herself, she continued on to the nearby town. To her surprise, in just six years, the roads were overgrown with weeds and abandoned cars were everywhere. It seemed no one had been here for a long time. With a shocked look on her face, Simone remembered the hospital refuge. Following the ubiquitous signs, she soon arrived at her destination. As she walked in, calling out, there was no response. She panicked with every passing minute. The decaying bodies everywhere indicated that this place had fallen long ago. Simone couldn't believe what she was seeing. Suddenly, a wolf emerged from the darkness, causing Simone to retreat into a room, slamming the door shut. When Raz woke up in the bunker, Simone had already safely returned. She had accomplished her mission. She told Raz that there was nothing outside, and the only places they could go were the other bunkers, hoping there would be enough food there. When Raz heard they were leaving first thing in the morning, he was excited. He hadn't seen the outside world in a long time. Then the siblings fell into a deep sleep. In the middle of the night, the oxygen level inside the bunker started to decline. Alarms started to blare one after another, but Simone, due to the lack of oxygen, had already fallen into a semi-conscious state. Thankfully, Raz woke up in time. Noticing the difficulty in breathing, he quickly dragged his sister to the door. It was only when the metal door slowly opened that Simone gradually regained her senses. But soon after, the barrel of a gun appeared in front of them. Then several more people emerged from the forest, surrounding the siblings. These people forced Simone back into the bunker. It turned out that the earlier decrease in oxygen was caused by them blocking the ventilation duct. After locking the pair in a room, these robbers began to search for survival supplies. But all the food here had long been exhausted, and they ultimately found nothing. The man who led the group cursed under his breath and told his companions to leave, intending to let the siblings die inside. One of them was upset, questioning why they had to be so reckless in taking lives. The leader didn't respond and continued walking towards the outside of the bunker. Suddenly, all the lights dimmed, leaving only a faint light in the room where Simone was detained. Realizing her peril, she quickly manipulated the power supply to attract the robber's attention. On the glass, she wrote to tell him that she knew where the food was. Then she destroyed all the location information about the bunkers. Now, only Simone knew where the food was. The leader named Martin was unsure whether to trust the woman in front of him because he had been fooled by women before. It's revealed that years ago, Martin was a sunny and handsome soldier. He was ordered to set up a cordon in the virus-stricken area to prevent anyone from going out. Martin was responsible for guarding a main road. Before long, he saw a woman slowly approaching, holding a baby in her arms. Martin immediately fired a warning shot, but she ignored him and kept walking. He was torn for a long time, but ultimately did not pull the trigger, allowing the woman to leave the virus control zone. After some time, Martin received a call for help from his teammates. He rushed over to check and found all his teammates lying on the ground with the woman who had escaped the control zone among them. The only surviving teammate told Martin that after the woman entered the tent, all the soldiers suddenly died, obviously infected by the woman. As soon as these words fell, the survivor began to cough violently, eventually collapsing and breathing his last. Martin never expected that the woman he had mercifully let go was a virus carrier and that her ability to infect others was so strong. He couldn't face his unit anymore and began a life of wandering. 
Martin, in the bunker, found himself in a predicament. He was torn over whether to let Simone out. At this point, his partner, Patrick, spoke up, revealing that one of their companions was too weak from hunger to continue. This prompted Martin to make a decision. He led Simone and Raz out of the bunker, with the siblings guiding them towards another bunker. Unbeknownst to them, not far ahead, several masked men were deploying a drone, hunting for the few survivors left. At that moment, Raz found the sight of trees and sunlight, unseen for many years, incredibly refreshing. Martin abruptly signaled for everyone to stop as a car appeared ahead. Patrick quickly pulled out a piece of aluminum foil and draped it over everyone. Just then, two masked men jumped out of the car, casually tossing out a mini-drone. A thermal image appeared before the two men. They were part of an armed group specifically hunting survivors. They suddenly noticed a woman passing by and immediately gave chase. Martin seemed to know these men well, hence the prepared foil to shield from detection. Simone heard the woman's cries for help and wanted to assist. Martin, however, ignored her. The young girl, Beatrice, seeing his indifference, couldn't help but say it was just two men. Following this, she and Simone gave chase, trying to save the woman. Martin had no choice but to follow reluctantly. The fleeing woman, in her haste, accidentally tripped and fell into a ditch. The two hunters were about to approach when Martin dispatched them with gunfire. However, the woman was beyond saving due to the viral rain. Any contact with open water sources on land meant certain death. Martin mercifully shot her to end her suffering. Simone and her brother had never experienced the cruelty of the post-apocalyptic world and took a long time to recover. Noticing Raz was barefoot, Martin told him to take a pair from the dead woman, but Raz refused. A man named Jean in their group had no choice but to wrap Raz's stinky feet with a plastic bag. It wasn't out of kindness, but to prevent Raz from contaminating any water sources, which could then spread the virus to others. Under Simone's guidance, the group continued their journey towards the next bunker. Seeing that darkness was about to fall, they decided to take shelter in an abandoned house for the night. As they glanced at the bodies scattered everywhere, Simone covered Raz's eyes, urging him to enter the house quickly. The group began to inspect the packages of the deceased hunters, finding a mini drone and a signal generator within. Next, they collected a pot of freshly distilled pure water, feeding it to their malnourished companion, Leah. Clearly, she was on the brink of starvation. Everyone looked expectantly at Simone, which inevitably stirred something in her heart. Searching for the bunker was originally just her survival plan, but she now genuinely wanted to help her temporary allies. Compared to the hunters, they weren't bad people at all. John even found a sturdy pair of boots for Raz. Early the next morning, they continued their journey. Raz found the boots on his feet quite novel. He seemed to get along well with Beatrice, and they chatted while walking at the end of the group. Suddenly, Raz stepped into a puddle, causing everyone to freeze. Martin even raised his gun, but Simone quickly stepped in to stop him. Kind-hearted Beatrice put on gloves and removed Raz's soaked boot. Thankfully, the boot was waterproof and Raz's sock was dry. Simone breathed a sigh of relief and led the group onward. Finally, they found the bunker deep in the forest. She placed her hand on the control panel and the door slowly opened. Everyone rushed in eagerly. The bunker was a veritable Eden amidst the apocalypse. The warehouse was full of supplies, enough for everyone to live on for a long time. However, Simone told Martin that she and her brother would leave soon, as she couldn't tolerate Martin's killing. Martin mocked Simone for being naive, telling her the world had long since changed. But since Simone had lived safely in the bunker for six years, it was difficult for her to understand his words. After starting the bunker's power, she planned to take some food and leave. She then found a charging phone that lit up. The screensaver was a photo of Simone and her brother. Undoubtedly, this phone belonged to their father. She excitedly went through the phone with her brother and found a video message from their father's boss, who instructed their scientist father to head to the Swedish headquarters to lead the development of a cure for the rain virus. This excited Simone, who believed that her father could possibly be there. The siblings decided to set off immediately to Sweden to find their father. Before that, Simone showed the video to Martin, hoping he would lead the group to Sweden. Martin refused without a second thought. He had heard rumors about a virus antidote countless times, and the video message was six years old. Clearly, the antidote had not been successfully developed, and her father was likely dead. Since they couldn't reach an agreement, the siblings decided to go on their own. Martin had been wandering outside for six years, so he reminded them that the only way to Sweden was through the city center filled with wanderers and then across the only long bridge. The siblings knew the journey was dangerous, but they set off with their food without hesitation. 
Martin didn't care, but Leah, who had nearly starved to death earlier, thought the siblings had helped everyone by finding food, so it wasn't right to let them venture out to their potential deaths. Beatrice also thought it was inappropriate. Seeing that Martin refused to leave, she angrily grabbed John, deciding that the three of them would go on their own. Actually, Beatrice, Leah, and John had known each other for quite a while. One day, while they were out in the morning, they happened to encounter Martin and Patrick, who were attempting to seize their resources. Sensing their intense, murderous intent, Beatrice revealed their hideout and the availability of more food in order to save their shitty lives. As a result, the five of them had a substantial feast in a farming base. Even though they laughed and chatted throughout, Martin and Patrick considered Beatrice's trio a burden and decided to leave with enough food the next morning. Beatrice discerned their intentions, so she stealthily approached Martin in the dead of night and smoothly completed a trade with him. Beatrice knew that it would be hard for their three to survive in this apocalyptic world on their own. She could only exchange their protection for Martin's shelter in this way, and as it happened, Martin was amenable to this. Hence, a five-person survival squad was formed, although this temporary group could easily fall apart over a minor incident. Meanwhile, Simone and her brother had arrived at the city center. This was a city that had been ravaged by the virus rain, where most life forms had perished. The streets were desolate, presenting a post-apocalyptic scene. The surviving siblings looked around in shock and noticed a bus blocking the road, so they curiously climbed aboard. Before long, Simone saw shadows moving outside through the glass and quickly pulled her brother into hiding. Fortunately, the figures were not enemies, but Beatrice's trio. Simone was elated, never expecting them to give up the comfortable life in the bunker and join her in facing hardships. While they were resting in a burger joint, a group of hungry survivors suddenly burst in. Everyone ran towards the back door. In the chaos, Simone accidentally got separated from her companions and went out onto the streets looking for her brother. She then noticed the walls plastered with yellowed missing person notices, which left a bitter taste in her heart. Suddenly, a small boy appeared before her to flex his skinny muscles. Simone had never seen such a frail individual. Just as she was about to approach and greet him, she noticed that the sky was overcast with heavy clouds, indicating imminent rain. She quickly pulled the frail boy into a nearby tall building for shelter. The boy was clearly starving, so much so that he was using painkillers to stave off hunger. Simone took the medicine box from him and pulled out some food from her backpack for him. Just then, the boy's father walked in from the next room, his eyes filled with suspicion. However, as the boy started eating the food with relish, the father's demeanor softened considerably. He advised Simone to leave the city as soon as possible because everyone here had gone mad. If it weren't for his son's frailty preventing him from traveling, the father would have left long ago to seek medical treatment. Apparently, there was a renowned doctor in a town on the other side of the bridge. Upon hearing the father's story, Simone pulled out some food, hoping it would help the child and his father leave this place. The father was so moved that he couldn't stop thanking her. As soon as the rain outside stopped, he ushered his child out the door. However, they were quickly surrounded by a group of hungry survivors who, seeing the food in the child's arms, became aggressive. Simone didn't dare to pause for a moment and ran towards the bakery. Thankfully, her companions had already gathered there. Simone urged everyone to quickly pack up and leave, but it was a step too late. A vagrant brandishing a knife came in and grabbed Raz, demanding everyone hand over their food. Just as everyone was at a loss, Martin and Patrick walked in holding their guns. Simone and the others were filled with surprise, never expecting them to appear there. Ever since Beatrice left the bunker, Martin had been restless. Even though their relationship was merely a transaction, he had developed genuine feelings for her. He was convinced that Beatrice wouldn't survive long outside and eventually decided to go look for her. Martin threatened the vagrant to drop his weapon, but the latter stabbed Raz and used the ensuing chaos to escape. At that moment, everyone's focus turned to checking Raz's injury. Simone mentioned that there was another bunker nearby, so they quickly put Raz in a shopping cart like a giant baby and hurried towards it. Luckily, the distance wasn't too far and they quickly reached their destination. But the bunker's door was already open. A chill ran down Simone's spine. It was clear that someone had already been there. As expected, the resources inside the bunker had been looted. Not even a single pill was left. Martin had no choice but to use duct tape to bandage Raz's wound for the time being. Once Raz had fallen asleep and snored like a pig, Martin took out a hunter's signal receiver, which surprisingly projected an electronic map. He discovered this previously while sheltering from the rain in the carriage and playing with it out of boredom. They found a thick wall enclosing a large area on the map. Martin speculated that perhaps the virus hadn't spread to the entire world and was just severe within this isolated area. 
The place Simone wanted to go to was just outside of this walled area, so Martin decided to accompany her. He knew that the only way to truly survive was to escape this virus quarantine zone. Otherwise, they were doomed sooner or later. But before that, Simone has to get her injured brother treated. From a vagrant, she had heard of a famous doctor in a small town on the other side of the bridge. However, getting there was not a simple matter, because the bridge was guarded year-round by a group of ruthless thugs. For her brother's safety, Simone decided to act as bait. Alone, she lingered near the bridge and, as expected, was discovered by the thug's drone. She had no choice but to quicken her pace and run into the depths of the streets, eventually reaching an abandoned building. The drone hovered above her, and the thugs soon arrived. Guarding the bridge was only a side job for them. Their main task was to hunt survivors. Sensing the situation, Simone held up her hands and waited for the hunters to approach. Suddenly, Martin and the others appeared and swiftly subdued the unguarded thugs. Martin asked Patrick to start their vehicle while he tied up the hunters, intending to interrogate them about the situation outside the quarantine zone. They had obtained this electronic map from them and were sure they knew something. However, these people were tight-lipped and refused to reveal any information, even when promised their freedom. John behind them noticed a tattoo on one of the thugs. It seemed to trigger a terrible memory, and he immediately yelled to kill them. This suited Martin's intentions, but Simone was somewhat disappointed at Martin, who had agreed to spare lives when planning the operation. He did not offer any explanation and hurried everyone to leave. Then a few gunshots echoed from within the building. Martin rushed out and urged everyone to get in the car right away, as other hunters could arrive at any moment. The group sat in the car, slowly crossing the bridge. The atmosphere was heavy among the group. Simone guessed they were probably resenting Martin's killing. John seemed deeply troubled since seeing the thug's tattoo, his thoughts drifting back to years ago. At that time, although he had narrowly escaped the rain disaster, he almost starved to death due to a lack of food. Fortunately, a little girl extended a helping hand, pulling him back from the brink of death. The girl's family was very kind and urged him to stay and live with them. It could have been his happiest days after the disaster, but it didn't last long. A group of armed thugs came to the little girl's home. The father asked John to hide with his daughter while he went to inquire, but the thugs insisted on taking the father away. As one of them stepped forward to enter the house, the father was shot and killed. The hidden little girl wanted to scream, but Jean desperately covered her mouth, watching helplessly as the thugs took the girl's mother away. A man with a snake tattoo left a deep impression on him. Only when he heard the car leaving did he breathe a sigh of relief. But when he removed his hand from the girl's mouth, he found she had stopped breathing. Overwhelmed by regret and frustration, he wailed in agony. After burying the little girl and her father, he had lost all spirit. Fortunately, Beatrice and Leah happened to pass by, and from then on, the three traveled together, which helped lift his mood up. But when Jean saw the man with the tattoo again, the hatred buried deep within him reignited. It was not until Martin personally ended the tattoo man that he felt somewhat at peace. After that, the group drove across the bridge and reached a nearby town. But the place was not small, and finding the doctor was not a simple task. Simone took out the previously seized drone. After fiddling with it, she managed to start it. The heat-sensitive signal was a great tool for locating people. They soon found a survivor in a house ahead. Simone couldn't wait and ran to knock on the door. Suddenly, a woman with a vigilant look came out. She must be the rumored doctor. Martin brought out the injured Raz. The woman finally let down her guard, welcomed everyone, and began to stitch Raz's wound after they brought him into the house. Simone kept thanking her. During their conversation, they learned that the doctor's husband and two children had all died in the toxic rain disaster. Now, she was the only one left, struggling to survive. The surgery went smoothly, and Raz was getting better. Simone, unguarded, told the doctor about her plan to find her father at the Apollon Company. When she mentioned her father's name, the doctor showed her surprise but quickly replaced it with a smile. She said Raz needed a few more tetanus shots and led the siblings to fetch the medicine. Unexpectedly, the doctor led them to a bunker. To Simone's surprise, the doctor also had access to it. Simone guessed that the doctor had previously worked for the Apollon Company. The woman admitted it but claimed she had not heard Simone's father's name. She then strapped Raz to a recliner, saying it was time for the injection. Simone felt something was off. Her father was one of the first employees of the company. It was impossible for people in the company not to know him. Seeing that she could not hide it anymore, the doctor choked Simone, shouting about avenging her children. She then tied Simone up, saying that the toxic rain was all caused by Simone's father, and now it was time for him to taste the pain of losing a child. As she said this, she set up a video device, preparing to personally end the siblings' lives. 
Meanwhile, Martin and the others were worried as Simone hadn't returned. They started looking around and noticed a car quietly driving by. Martin recognized it as the hunter's car. Jean nervously peeked, seeing the familiar snake tattoo again. He realized that Martin did not kill them. Jean became agitated, picked up a weapon, and ran outside. He quietly approached the tattooed man and shot him down, but he was soon surrounded by his companions. Martin wanted to shoot back but was stopped by Patrick. They were outnumbered and could only watch helplessly as Jean was taken away. Regaining his senses, Martin escaped through the back door, signaling Beatrice and the others to leave immediately. They didn't forget about Simone and her brother and quickly arrived at the bunker following their tracks. By this time, the doctor had already picked up a metal syringe and was about to inject it into Raz. Simone was trying her best to stall by talking about bullshit, even confessing that she caused her mother's death. This greatly moved the doctor, who was a mother herself. Her hand holding the syringe started to tremble. At that moment, a gunshot rang out and the doctor fell to the ground. It was Patrick who had come to the rescue. After gaining their freedom, Simone picked up the metal syringe on the ground before leaving with everyone. Eventually, they reached a remote residential area, deciding to stay there for the night. At this point, Patrick was very upset, challenging Martin on why he let the hunters go. If not for that, Jean would not have been captured. Martin firmly believed he did nothing wrong and did not want to explain himself. Everyone sat silently around the fire as if mourning the loss of Jean. Unable to stand the atmosphere, Martin walked outside, feeling distressed. Simone ran over to apologize. If not for her insistence, Martin would not have let those villains go. The next day came. The group of survivors was moving through the woods, but it looked like it was about to rain and they had not found a place to shelter. Even the drone they launched yielded nothing. Everyone felt a crisis looming, and emotions began to spiral. Fortunately, they found a huge mansion deep in the jungle. Although they wondered why it was not marked on the map, they hurried to the mansion. As they were about to enter, a few kindly strangers came out of the house saying they could offer lodging, but they must surrender their weapons. Martin did not know how many people were inside the house, and the rain was about to start, so in the end, they had to compromise. Although there were many people in the mansion, they didn't seem to be bad people. They prepared rooms for Simone and the others. Martin pushed the door, only to find it was locked. But there was no point in overthinking it now, as it was already starting to pour outside. The group fell asleep in a state of unease. Early the next morning, the older woman of the mansion woke them up, saying it was time for a bath. On the way to the bathroom, they discovered that they were growing fruits and vegetables in the backyard. The woman picked a tomato for everyone to try. Everyone stood still, not daring to reach out. Seeing their doubts, the woman tasted it herself. The group then arrived at a shower room. After the woman demonstrated that the water was also safe, Simone and the others finally let their guard down, preparing to enjoy a good shower. Only Martin remained wary, running off alone to investigate the situation. But after a long search, he found nothing unusual. When Martin returned to the hall, he found Simone and the others indulging in a feast at the dining table. This puzzled him even more. In the post-apocalypse, it was surprising enough to have fresh vegetables and bread, but where did the meat come from? The bearded man, who seemed to be the cult leader here, comforted Martin, suggesting that they should trust each other more in such dire times. This church-like dogma only made Martin more uneasy. After everyone finished their meal, he quietly followed a staff member to a dim basement, which seemed to be the kitchen where chefs were busily cutting meat. Martin was shocked by that. He quietly went to the kitchen in the basement warehouse, saw a chef cutting a whole piece of meat, and instantly felt a bad feeling. He wanted to go forward to check it out, but was caught by a staff member. Martin claimed that he was looking for the toilet, then hurriedly left, but he couldn't let it go. He told Simone about his discovery and took her back to the basement kitchen, but this time there was no one there, and the table where the meat was cut was empty. Martin was sure that what he saw was not an illusion. He believed that there was something strange about the mansion and they should leave as soon as possible. Simone looked at him full of doubt. Leaving was definitely a must, but her brother's wound had not healed and was not suitable for continuous travel. So they called for a doctor in the mansion to treat her brother. After checking the wound, the doctor said that Raz needed some antibiotics. When he took out the metal syringe, Simone felt something was wrong because it was very similar to the syringe used by the female doctor who tried to harm her brother. She quickly lied that her brother was allergic to the medication, preventing the doctor from injecting Raz. 
Taking advantage of his distraction, Simone secretly stuffed the metal syringe into her sleeve. When she returned to her room, she took out the female doctor's syringe for comparison and found that both were very similar, both produced by the Apollon Company. This unsettled Simone. She rushed to question the doctor why he had medicines from the Apollon Company. The group was wary of the syringe but were not willing to reveal anything. The cult leader kept saying that everything was in the past. Simone didn't get the answer she wanted, so she had to tell her companions about it. After hearing this, Martin was even more unwilling to stay here, urging everyone to leave. However, Simone didn't agree, wanting to investigate the relationship between this place and the Apollon Company. The others were also enjoying the superior life of the mansion and were not willing to leave, especially Leah. She and the mansion's older woman were devout believers and their personalities matched well. After only a few interactions, the old woman regarded Leah as her daughter, which moved her deeply. She began to talk about her tragic experiences. It turns out, at a party before the rain disaster, the naive Leah was tricked. She became uncontrollably wild while her friends made fun of her and filmed the entire ordeal. The next morning, Leah discovered that the video had been posted online, and even her mother had seen it. Her mother threatened to sever ties with her, causing Leah to break down. It took her a long time to regain composure, and she wandered listlessly to the window. There she saw the friends who had played her, laughing and chatting as if nothing had happened. Feeling abandoned by the world, she sank to the ground and began to pray. As if her prayers were heard, a torrential downpour suddenly began. All her tormentors dropped dead without warning, leaving Leah in shock. She called her mother again, and this time, her mother's attitude had completely changed. She promised to come and pick up Leah right away. But the next moment, a scream came from the phone. Her mother had also succumbed to the toxic rain. After hearing Leah's story, the old woman showed sympathy and comforted Leah in a way that a fellow believer would, inviting her to participate in the monthly festival, as it was the only way for her to truly integrate into the mansion. On the surface, everyone in the mansion seemed harmless, but Martin believed there were secrets in this place. He decided to sneak into the underground kitchen again. After kicking open the door, he found it empty. At this time, everyone was gathered in the dining room, participating in the so-called mansion celebration. The cult leader flexed his messy beard and solemnly reminded everyone to cherish the food in front of them. Once it was ingested, everyone present would become indistinguishable from each other. The newcomers didn't understand what the cult leader meant. When he announced the start of the meal, they began to eat without thinking much. Meanwhile, Martin in the underground kitchen made a discovery. A pool of blood remained on the drain. He wondered since the apocalypse had been going on for six years, where could fresh livestock come from? He approached a freezer, nervously opened the door, and was horrified. A torso with both hands chopped off hung inside. However, Simone and the others didn't know the truth. After enjoying a lavish dinner, the cult leader announced the search for the next volunteer to offer their body. Leah immediately realized what meat they had just eaten. Simone and the others couldn't help but vomit uncontrollably. The others in the mansion watched them calmly, thinking that the real excitement was yet to come. Because they had eaten this meal, everyone was indistinguishable from each other and had to participate in the upcoming lottery ceremony. Whoever drew a note wrapped in flowers would become the next month's food. The discomfort in Simone and the others was quickly replaced by fear. By the time Martin rushed into the dining room, it was too late. He wanted to halt the ceremony, but the doctor quickly pointed a gun at his head. He could only watch helplessly as the crowd carried on. Trembling, Simone unfolded a paper ball, only sighing in relief when she found it was empty. Her brother and Beatrice also turned out to be safe. However, when Leah opened her paper ball, she was visibly distressed. Just as she was about to be taken to the underground kitchen, the old woman suddenly stood up, snatched the flowers from her hand, and offered herself as a substitute. Leah burst into tears. She was touched that the old woman, whom she had known for only a few days, truly saw her as a daughter. After this ordeal, Simone and her group didn't want to stay in the mansion any longer. But the cult leader made no attempt to keep them, believing there was no better place in the world. Before leaving, Simone couldn't help but ask the doctor about the contents of the syringe and whether he knew her father. The doctor admitted that he used to be her father's assistant and that they had destroyed the world together. Right then, the cult leader quickly interrupted him. After Simone and the others reluctantly left, the cult leader started to reprimand the doctor, saying he was still regretting his past and was no longer suitable to stay here. After finishing, he walked into the house alone and closed the door. 
Back in the jungle, Martin and the others were contemplating their next move when the doctor suddenly caught up with them. He shouted at Simone, asking if she wanted to know what's in the syringe. Then he abruptly stabbed it into his own neck. In an instant, he began to foam at the mouth and collapsed. Martin quickly shot him to end his suffering. Simone watched in disbelief. After regaining her composure, she picked up the syringe from the ground. It was clear that it contained the virus from the rain. She couldn't bear to think of the consequences if it were injected into her brother. She kept wondering why her father's company mass-produced the virus. The group fell asleep, filled with doubt and unease. Early the next morning, Martin and Simone were calculating the route to the quarantine wall. Given their current walking speed, it would take several days to get there. They had to find another bunker to resupply. Martin noticed Raz and Beatrice chatting and laughing, which irritated him. He ordered Raz to get up and search for a bunker. In what seemed like a fit of petulance, the boy claimed his injury had worsened, preventing him from going anywhere. Simone became anxious, telling her brother to rest. Beatrice volunteered to stay and care for the injured, and seeing this, Martin couldn't object. Under Simone's lead, the four once again embarked on a journey to find a bunker. After spending several days together, Simone and Martin had become closer. This upset Patrick, who thought Simone's influence was making Martin less decisive, which he saw as a major taboo in the post-apocalyptic survival rulebook. Their journey went smoothly, and they found a bunker without much difficulty. After opening the door, they began to search the place. It was clear someone had been living there, maybe they had just stepped out temporarily. Martin urged everyone to gather supplies and leave quickly, but the abundance of eyeglasses and keys in the drawer piqued his interest. Then Patrick discovered a computer filled with numerous videos. On clicking one at random, everyone was stunned. It showed the lab staff injecting a girl's father with a viral agent, totally ignoring the desperate pleas of the little girl. When they confirmed that he had no immunity to the virus, they began the next round of experiments. When all the test subjects were exhausted, an old man watching the experiment reminded the staff that they still had the little girl. Simone was taken aback after watching the video. She recognized the elderly man directing the whole process as her father, but she weakly defended him, saying they were only trying to develop a cure. Patrick retorted that no matter the explanation, it couldn't cover up the crimes of Apollon Company. He was now convinced that the hunters were capturing survivors to provide test subjects for the Apollon Company. Martin intervened in their argument, insisting they should leave immediately or they'd become test subjects too. But when they reached the bunker door, they were stunned. The sky was filled with ominous clouds and rain could start at any moment. The group had to decide whether to risk leaving or stay in the bunker. Martin made the decisive call to stay put. If it rained, the hunters and experimenters wouldn't be able to reach them. Little did he know, not far from the bunker, a group of hunters was using drones to hunt down the few remaining survivors, all to provide fresh subjects for their lab experiments. Countless innocent lives have been lost due to their actions. Simone and her group planned to leave the lab immediately, but with the sky blackened by ominous clouds and rain imminent, they dared not to risk it. Simone, worry etched on her face, sat outside the bunker, watching as the storm grew fiercer. Suddenly, Patrick stumbled out, bottle in hand, mumbling about how no one ever cared about him. He then walked straight into the rain. Simone rushed forward to stop him, reminding him of his importance to the team. But instead of gratitude, Patrick angrily pushed her heavy body aside, exposing her to the toxic rain. Simone was filled with despair as she realized that Patrick felt no remorse. Instead, he was shouting for someone to bring a gun. She couldn't understand why Patrick hated her so much. But actually, before the apocalyptic disaster, Patrick was a total failure. He was fired from his job, dumped by his girlfriend, and even his father despised him, giving him his old car and telling him to travel the world and never return. Patrick seemed to have anticipated this, accepting it all with equanimity. He began a life of wandering, which continued until a sudden storm killed everyone but him. He didn't panic, because whether others lived or died, Patrick was always alone. That was until he met Martin, another lone wanderer at a repair station. They hit it off immediately and braved the post-apocalyptic world together for six years until Simone and her brother joined them. But now, Patrick noticed that everything changed. Not only had Martin become indecisive, but he had also distanced himself from Patrick. That's why he blamed everything on Simone and harbored the desire to make her disappear. Seeing Martin and Leah emerge from the bunker, Patrick urged them to shoot. But Martin, who had grown fond of Simone, was torn. He couldn't just kill her. 
Leah, however, was more decisive. She positioned herself in front of Martin's gun, arguing that they were a team and should face adversity together, not turn on each other. She then stepped back into the poisonous rain. Martin was shocked and ended up wrestling with Patrick, who was insisting on shooting. Meanwhile, Leah and Simone took the opportunity to retreat into the bunker. Soon, Martin and Patrick regained composure and isolated the two women exposed to the toxic rain, hoping for a miracle. Both women, fully aware of their limited time, remained surprisingly optimistic. Leah didn't regret her reckless act of saving another's life. She may have already died back at the mansion when the old woman had traded her life for Leah's. All that Simone was worried about was her younger brother. She hoped Raz could survive, unaware that he was facing a grave crisis far away. Previously, Raz had used the excuse of healing from an injury to get a chance to be alone with Beatrice. Their feelings for each other escalated. However, an unexpected downpour changed everything. The atmosphere inside the house grew intimate and fishy, and the two moved closer to each other, oblivious that the roof had started to leak. Just as they were about to tongue massage each other, a raindrop fell on Beatrice's face. Raz hastily pushed her aside, but it was too late. Beatrice had been wetted not by herself, but by the poisonous rain. She knew she was about to die and despair filled her. Raz rushed forward to comfort her using his skinny muscles, unafraid of being infected by her, and said they should die together. Beatrice was touched and decided that even if she was to die, she would not leave any regrets. So they hurriedly headed to a hormone yoga session. Surprisingly, several hours later, neither of them seemed to show signs of infection. Raz wondered if hormone yoga could contain the virus and savored the happiness of surviving such a disaster, unaware that Beatrice's eyes were filled with tears. The next morning, Raz woke up to see a dog by Beatrice's side. He shooed it away, then realized something was wrong. Beatrice had no reaction at all. Sitting up, he saw that she had stopped breathing. Raz was both heartbroken and confused, unable to understand why this had happened. Meanwhile, at the bunker, Leah and Simone, who had also been drenched in the rain, showed no signs of infection after a night of waiting. Martin found this very strange. If the rainwater contained a virus, they should be dead as shit by now. He regretted his harsh treatment of Simone the day before and was distressed. He wondered why it wasn't him who ran into the rain. Ignoring Patrick's objections, Martin let Simone and Leah out of the bunker. He then went outside and looked at the rain that used to terrify everyone. He took a deep breath and walked out into it. Feeling the raindrops fall on him and sensing no discomfort, Martin confirmed that the rainwater no longer contained the virus. Simone and Leah excitedly ran into the rain, jumping and hopping like headless fries. After this incident, the relationship between Martin and Simone heated up. But when he found out that Patrick wanted to harm Simone, he chose to expel Patrick from the team, leaving his partner of six years to fend for himself. The poor man was abandoned once again, walking away with a sad face. But when he returned to the cabin where they had previously lived, he saw Raz preparing to leave with the now deceased Beatrice in his arms. Terrified of being infected by the virus, Patrick backed away and ran off into the distance, only relaxing when he was sure he was safe. As he pondered his next move, he suddenly felt a bag being placed over his head. In the wooden cabin, Raz carried Beatrice, moving towards the direction of the bunker. He was eager to reunite with his sister and to understand why Beatrice had suddenly died while he himself remained unscathed. Inside the bunker, Simone and the others were busy packing their supplies, ready to leave. Upon hearing that Patrick had been banished, Simone felt that Martin's action was somewhat extreme. She wanted to persuade him otherwise when suddenly a cry for help echoed from outside. They rushed to see Raz carrying Beatrice. They were all taken aback, instinctively keeping their distance from him. Martin made a quick decision, confining Raz to an isolation room. Simone, seeing her brother in pain, wanted to help but felt powerless. She could only enter the isolation room wearing a hazmat suit, advising her brother to stay away from Beatrice, fearing potential contagion. But Raz was beyond caring. He felt that the dog from the morning had infected Beatrice. He was consumed with self-loathing for not having died along with her. Seeing his sister also maintaining a respectful distance, Raz was filled with despair. After making arrangements for Beatrice's body, he walked out of the bunker alone, having lost the will to live. He planned to find a secluded place to end his shitty life. Unexpectedly, his walkie-talkie suddenly came alive. This was a device they had previously seized from a hunter. A voice was instructing his underlings, ordering them to prepare for an assault on the bunker. The people who had captured Patrick turned out to be from the hunter organization. The gang's captain seemed to know Patrick, immediately grilling him for information about Simone and the others. At first, Patrick tried to play the tough guy, but after they pulled out one of his rotten teeth, he started spilling everything. 
Upon hearing that Simone's father worked at Apollon, the captain was taken aback because he himself was an Apollon employee, responsible for unsavory tasks, like hunting survivors. The company's boss explained that this was all to develop a cure for the virus and to save the world. Before sending all the hunters into the quarantine zone, everyone was forced to drink a liquid containing nanocapsules. Their neck skin quickly developed an allergic reaction, yet that wasn't the most lethal part. If anyone tried to flee or resist, the capsules in their body would shatter, releasing a deadly virus. This fear kept the hunters obedient, even though they were in the quarantine zone. Upon learning from Patrick that Simone and the others were hiding in the bunker, the captain commanded his men to attack the bunker. Unbeknownst to him, Raz overheard the conversation. Having lost the will to live, Raz informed them via the walkie-talkie that he was at a quarry, and they should hurry up if they wanted to catch him. Patrick, however, sensed something was amiss. Raz had reported Beatrice's infection before. He should be dead by now. The captain was excited to find a carrier of the antibodies. If he could bring Raz back to headquarters, an antidote might be developed, so he ordered his men to move quickly. In the meantime, Simone and the others in the bunker realized that Raz was missing. After searching all the rooms, they found no trace of him. Worried for her brother's safety, Simone released a drone outside. It wasn't long before she spotted four figures surrounding a person near the quarry. She guessed it must be Raz being captured by the hunters. Fortunately, she didn't act impulsively, but returned to the bunker to gather reinforcements. Just then, she saw Martin and Leah burying Beatrice. Everyone felt the bitterness of the loss, but Simone had to ask for help to rescue her captured brother. Martin and Leah agreed that they wouldn't abandon any team members. On the slope behind the quarry, the three of them used the drone to figure out the distribution of the hunters and began discussing the rescue plan. They made a horrifying noise, luring a hunter into an ambush. With no suspense, the man was captured. After extracting from him that he had five comrades left, Martin knew they couldn't confront them directly with their limited manpower. He had no choice but to offer the captain a trade, Raz, for the captured hunter. He quickly arranged a meeting place and hung up the radio. Both parties soon arrived at the meeting point, with only one person showing up from each side. Simone hoped they would release her brother. The captain flatly refused. He planned to take Raz back to headquarters and inject him with the virus to confirm whether he was immune. Simone became frantic, knowing if her brother couldn't resist the virus, he would surely die. Just then, Martin, holding the hostage, walked out. Leah pointed a vial of virus at the hostage's neck. If they didn't release Raz, their man was dead. Feeling the determination of Simone's group, the captain had no choice but to compromise and commanded his men to bring Raz over. As the two hostages passed each other, Simone noticed Raz still looked despondent. Furious, she confronted him that they had paid much effort to save him. Her words pierced Raz's heart. The boy snatched the virus injector and shot himself with the virus. Everyone was shocked as Raz fell to the ground. But the next moment, Raz opened his eyes. Clearly, he was genuinely immune to the virus. With nothing more to say, Raz became the hope of saving the world. And they wouldn't need to risk their lives experimenting with the virus at Apollon Company. Simone and the others decided to go to the company headquarters with the hunters. If the antidote could be developed, everyone could leave the quarantine zone. But Martin didn't forget about his partner Patrick. Persuaded by Simone, he chose to forgive him. Simone and her group all piled into the car, ready to set out. The hunter was grateful to Raz, even kissing his injured forehead before they left. However, they had not driven far when the hunter suddenly collapsed in agony. He had clearly been infected by the virus. It turns out that Raz was not immune, but was instead a terrifying carrier. His body fluids contained the deadly virus, which was the true cause of Beatrice's death. But Simone and her brother were unaware of this, and were hopeful that the viral disaster would end soon. The group arrived at Apollon, the only tech company in the apocalyptic world. After a series of checks and sanitizations, they arrived at a complex of bunker-like buildings. The captain said someone wished to meet Simone and Raz, while the others were to wait in a bunker. Simone went to the second floor of the headquarters, where an old man emerged. Simone recognized it was her father, whom she hadn't seen in six years. But instead of excitement, she was filled with resentment. Raz, unfamiliar with their father, unconsciously stepped back, stumbled, and fainted. Medical staff quickly took him to the medical room. Simone still had many questions, but her father had no time to answer, asking her to wait for him in a room inside before he left with Raz. On the other side, Martin and the others finally reached the underground fortress. The structure was similar to the outside, but resources were much more plentiful. Leah discovered a familiar jacket in a corner of the warehouse. It belonged to their companion, Jean. 
Everyone had thought he was dead since he was captured by the hunters. With high hopes, Leah searched around and finally found the lively John in the bathroom. The hunters hadn't killed him after all. Martin and the others were ecstatic. After all, in the apocalypse, every reliable teammate mattered. At that moment, a staff member walked in. She said that Martin and the rest, who had been wandering outside for years, needed to replenish their nutrients. John had been drinking it and didn't find it odd. However, the others fell into silence. Martin asked the staff member to take a sip first, and to their surprise, she gladly drank first. After the false alarm, everyone relaxed and drank the nutrient liquid. Elsewhere, Simone was waiting for her father to arrive. Soon, the door opened and her father walked in. He was grateful for Simone's care for Raz over the years, but Simone was not appreciative and asked why he hadn't come to find them in the past six years. Her father wanted to explain, but seemed hesitant. He took Simone out of the room, revealing that the room was under surveillance. As they walked down the corridor, they saw several medical staff conducting a full-body examination on Raz. Her father was well aware of his situation. Raz was the first to receive a high-purity antidote that worked, meaning he indeed had antibodies in his body. Simone asked why they hadn't brought Raz in earlier to develop a vaccine. Her father didn't answer. Instead, he led Simone to a basement where there were no surveillance devices, finally enabling them to speak freely. With a grave expression, the father warned Simone that she and Raz shouldn't be here and they must leave as soon as possible. The antibodies of the virus in Raz had merged with his bone marrow. If they were used to develop a cure, Raz would surely die. That's why the father hadn't sought them out in the past six years. During this time, he only returned secretly once at the company's request. After a fleeting glance at his children, he sealed off the bunker's entrance and lied to his colleagues, saying Simone and Raz were dead. He then erased the bunker's existence from the base documents. This was why Simone had been unable to contact other bunkers. Regretting his decision to report Raz's antibody production to the company, the father had to convince the company to drop their interest in Raz. Simone understood why her father was conducting experiments on ordinary people. If others could produce antibodies, Raz would truly be safe. Although she felt uneasy, she understood the lengths her father went to protect Raz. The two agreed to meet at the company entrance to escape together, but the father had to find a way to get Raz out first. When he arrived at the quarantine room, he found something amiss. The doctor caring for Raz suddenly started coughing and collapsed, clearly infected by the virus. Shocked, the father asked Raz what had just happened. The doctor had been preparing to collect a saliva sample when Raz woke up. Uncooperative, Raz bit the doctor's palm, drawing a fair amount of blood. The doctor died inexplicably soon after. The father quickly swabbed for a saliva sample and began observing it with the testing equipment. The results shook him to his core, causing him to tremble. Looking at a visibly anxious Raz, the father immediately activated the base's defense alarm. Martin sensed trouble and tried to leave, but the door was firmly shut. Amid the chaos, Simone's father reached the conference room and video called the company's boss. He revealed that Raz wasn't a carrier of antibodies, but a highly contagious virus spreader, despite his ability to coexist with the virus. The boss was undeterred, believing they could develop a cure from the analysis of Raz's bone marrow. He then hung up. Outside, Simone overheard her father's conversation and felt he should find a way to help Raz. But her father had changed his mind. Raz was a walking contagion and must not leave the base or the virus could break out at any time. But Simone was determined to save her brother and wouldn't let him die here. Simone quickly arrived at the bunker where Martin was and told them to block the ventilation shafts. Once the oxygen levels dropped, the doors would automatically open. She then rushed to Raz's room, instructing him to put on a protective suit and prepare to leave the bunker. Martin was also desperate. To speed up the depletion of oxygen, they lit fires inside the bunker. The plan worked, and the bunker doors opened, allowing everyone to escape safely. When they reached the underground garage, they were stopped by Simone's father, now armed. He was adamant that Raz could not leave the base, and even shot Martin, who was trying to protect Raz. Just as he was about to shoot Raz, Simone shoved her father aside. At that moment, Patrick arrived in a car. Everyone helped the injured Martin into the car, and they managed to drive out of the base. The quarantine wall was not far ahead, and they planned to leave the virus quarantine zone. But as they reached it, they were stopped by a thick checkpoint. Simone recognized the guard as an old acquaintance, the captain of the hunters. She tried to negotiate, but he regretfully informed them that they had been infected by virus capsules mixed into their nutritional drink. If they didn't cooperate, they could die at any time. Now, all but Simone and Raz were infected. Martin advised Simone and Raz to leave them behind. After much thought, Simone couldn't bear to abandon her friends. She decided to stay in the quarantine zone with them. 
The captain, now tasked only with guarding the checkpoint, ordered his men to lower their weapons and watched as Simone and the others turned back towards the quarantine zone. At that moment, Simone felt a sense of relief. Whether they were in the quarantine zone or not, as long as she was with her friends, it was all the same to her. Meanwhile, the boss of the Apollon Company was introducing his plan to save the world to a group of top tycoons. He even admitted that the virus had been spread throughout the country by himself, using artificial rainfall. With that, the first season of this drama concludes. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.